If you have your Bibles, we're in Hebrews chapter 5. We've been going through uh, the book of Hebrews, um, and we're going to continually go through that. This Wednesday, um, you know, we're, it's not going to be Hebrews. It's going to be, you know, our, our normal Wednesday night thing. When well, that's going to start, when we, uh, when we start uh, changing that, you know, uh, to the teaching on Hebrews on Wednesday night, will be when Missions Emphasis starts. So next Sunday, it's, gonna, uh, it's starting so that for the next three Sundays, we're going to have uh, our teaching on Hebrews will be on Wednesday night, and then obviously the missions emphasis will be on that Sunday. So we didn't want to, you know, uh, you know, stop, you know, uh, doing the teaching and all that kind of stuff. But obviously Wednesday nights, you know, we're still going to be, we have our Bible study, and those three Wednesdays we'll be having um, our teaching on uh, Hebrews, you know, for those times as well. So like I said, if you have your Bibles, Hebrews chapter five, Hebrews chapter five. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained of for, uh, for men in taking or uh, in things pertaining to God, that he may offer uh, both gifts, uh, gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can, uh, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for, uh, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity, and by reason. Hereof he ought as for the people, so also for him uh, for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh his honor or this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he, uh, as he saith also in another place, Thou art uh, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of, uh, of his flesh, when he had offered prayers and supplications with, uh, with, with strong crying and tears unto, uh, unto him, that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Though uh, he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the, the things which he suffered and being made perfect he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey uh, that obey him called of god as a high priest after the order of melchizedek one of, of whom we have all uh, we have many things to say and hard uh, to be uttered seeing uh, ye are dull of hearing for when, uh, for when, uh, for the time ought ye, uh, sorry, ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the uh, first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as uh, have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For every one that use, uh, useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But uh, strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Even those who, by reason of use, have uh, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Let's pray, Heavenly Father. I thank you for your word this morning, Lord. I pray that you would fill me with your spirit, that I uh, that I would preach the full counsel of God this morning. And Lord, I pray that you would give us not only ears to hear, but Lord, that we would do your word as well. And God, that um, that when excuses come and all those different things that would try and st uh, stop us or different distractions, Lord, we would say, Lord, no, I have determined that I will follow Christ and I will do everything in my power to do that. And Lord, I thank you for this morning. May your word fall upon fertile soil this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, I don't know about, you know about the kids nowadays. I don't know if they know this store or not, but I'm going to you know, ask this question. How many of you know Toys R Us? All right, and I know that that was you know something that a few years ago it went bankrupt and everything else and all those, those things. But what was the big tagline? I mean, I re, you know for me, going through there, you know, going through the lines upon lines, especially around Christmas time, it seemed like that was the only time that we would ever go to Toys R Us was so I can go out there and show my parents, you know, what I wanted for Christmas. And they had aisles upon aisles upon aisles upon aisles of different things. And I remember one of the things. One of the big taglines, and I can guarantee that if I say it now, all of you will know it, you know, that no Toys R Us. It says, I don't want to grow up. Why? Because if I did, I wouldn't be a Toys R Us kid, right? 
I mean, think about that. You know, uh, that was the big tagline, and they would show adults and everything else that were up there, you know, that, that were at Toys R Us, and, you know, all the, but they all said, I don't want to grow up. Why? Because if I did, I wouldn't be a Toys R Us kid. And I, th- I sat there and began to think about that as I thought about this, and I thought about what the Bible says here and what the Bible is trying to convey is that how many people have professed and gotten saved by the Lord but have never grown? How many people have professed that they're saved, they're on their way to heaven, but they've never grown? You say, well, that's impossible. No, it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's definitely possible because, you know what, I've seen some adults that have never grown in the ways of different things. I'm not talking about anybody in here in particularly, but I have seen people act childish. People that are like in their 50s and 60s act like they're a child, throwing temper tantrums, throwing all these things. Why? Because they never wanted to grow up. They, you know, and the thing is, is that you know, obviously in, in the church, these people have believed on, you know, believed on Jesus years ago and are saved, like I said, yet have remained spiritual babies in Christ for years. They never, they've never come to that point to be able to discern fully right from wrong. And oftentimes where this comes in play is, is their interpretation of Scripture, interpre- uh, interpretation of what the Bible says. Because what they will do is they will say, well, the Bible says this, but the Bible doesn't. Okay, they'll come out and say, like, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness. That's in the Bible. Who said that originally? Does anybody know? It was Benjamin Franklin. He's not in the Bible. He's not a prophet. He didn't write any of the Bible, just so you know. But there's all these different things that, you know, out there or different, you know, uh, sayings and stuff like that that people, you know, claim that are in the Bible but are not. And so these are, you, you know, usually, oftentimes, uh, you know, especially on the news as of late, they will come out and say, well, this is what Christians believe. And they, they don't say should believe, but they say this is what Christians believe, and it's nowhere near the truth. But people, you know, that are, you know, that are still spiritual babies in Christ, maybe they're young believers, maybe they've never grown up, maybe they've, uh, all those things, they'll sit there and they believe them over what the Bible says. Why? Because they're not doing the things that they need to do in order to grow in the Lord. Well, as we look at, you know, Hebrews chapter 5, we're going to see that this is an encouragement for us to grow in the Lord into mature believers, all right? And not, you know, go around just have a building full of babies, all right? And so I'm going to go through the chapter. I'm going to kind of go through, you know, the beginning parts of, these, of this chapter a, a little bit quickly because I want to actually get back to that point this morning about uh, growing in the Lord. But I've titled this message this morning, uh, the message this morning, Milk or Meat? Milk or meat? And so number one is this, is that Jesus, our high priest, sympathizes with us. He sympathizes that we don't have the fact that, you know, that he is so far away from us, that, that he's a God that's far off, that doesn't care about your affairs. But the thing is, is that the Bible says that he cares for us. That's why he tells us to cast all of our cares upon him. He's able to sympathize with us. You know, uh, because, you know, for one thing, he was not only 100% divine in nature, but he was also 100% human. He was 100% man. As we read in the previous chapter, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot, be, uh, which cannot be touched with the, inf- uh, with the feeling of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Christ is able to understand what you go through. It's the thing is that I was talking, you, know, you know, I talked to some people, they say, well, God doesn't know. God knows what you go through. It's not even just the fact that he knows it, he felt it as well, because he was not only 100% God, but he was 100% man as well. And so we have people out there saying, well, that's impossible. That's 200%. You can't have 200% of anything. You know what? I'm not God. You know what? And you, uh, you, you try and tell God that because he's 100% God and 100% man. That's how he's able to sympathize with us. But as we see in these first four verses, there are, you know, it talks about you know, ordination and qualification for the high priest. The role of the high priest in the Old Testament. Every high priest was taken from among men and it was ordained for men in the things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts 
and sacrifices for sins. Now we're going to see in these, you know, in these verses, in some of these verses, that there are similarities between the high priest and what a pastor is supposed to do. Okay, and so obviously in this first part, the fact is, is that the pastor is actually supposed to come from among the people to teach the people about the things of God. There's nothing special in the fact of, like some people almost look like a, at a pastor like he's some sort of king or president, you know, and, and the thing is that there are no, kings and, uh, and, uh, and presidents aren't special either. They, they think they are, but they're not. But there is to come from the people to teach the people about the things of God. Because you know what, it's, it's one of those things, and the thing is, is that for people to sit there and say, I want to be a pastor, well, think about those things, you know, for the men that want to be pastors. The thing is, is that when you, when you become a pastor, you're judged more critically than a lay person. You say, well, then I don't want to be it. I don't want to be judged more harshly than a lay person. If God calls you and you run away from it, it's going to be far worse for you. Because the thing is that you're going to have, you're, you're, there's always going to be that nagging feeling that you know what you're supposed to be doing, but you're not doing it. Amen. And you say, well, you know what? God wouldn't do that. Yes, talk to Jonah. Because Jonah tried to run away, and finally he actually did what he was supposed to do, even though that he didn't want to do it. Amen. The second thing, you know, uh, the pastor or the high priest is supposed to stand in the gap for the congregation of believers. When, you know, uh, when there are those that maybe that, that don't have a lot of people surrounding them in prayer or they have a lot of people in prayer, the pastor is still supposed to be there standing in the gap, praying and, and teaching them the, the word of God to, you know, so that way they're not picked off by the wolves. Or as Matt and I were talking about, by the coyotes this morning. We don't want sheep... You know, we don't want, you know, God's sheep being picked off by wolves or coyotes or any other kind of animal that's going to, you know, any kind of other predator that is out there, right? The high, you know, the high priest must be able to have compassion on the ignorant. Don't you want a pastor that has compassion upon you? That is that's not, you know, like, get away from me. I'm so high and mighty. You have no idea. You must bow before me. And you say, well, that would never be a pa-. I've met quite a few pastors that had that attitude that basically said, you know what? Do you realize who you're talking to right now? And I said, yes, I do, and I walk away. Because I don't, to me, I, I've never been a politician. I've never done those kind of things. I've never sat there and thought of myself as being more highly than I ought to. You know, I just have never you know, had that, you know, that idea and frame of mind that I sat there and said, oh, you know what? You don't know who you're talking to. And I pray that the Lord would keep me that way. But they must have compassion on the ignorant. That is those that don't know that much. They need to have compassion upon those. Maybe there are new believers or ones that have not grown in the Lord that much. And they are those who are out of the way, as it, you know, as it puts it there. What that means is those that are not saved, those that are, that are outside of Christ, those that are outside of salvation, that you know, they should have compassion upon them as well. And the thing is, is that he is, uh, he is to... Um, that sorry, it, it says that he is uh, compassed with infirmity. In other words, we need to bear with one another's burdens. We can't sit there, and I know that there are times where there, there and you know that there. I'm not. I'm saying not to be this person. All right, there are people out there that every single time, and you know who they are. That every single time that you're out there, they have some sort of thing that has happened in their life, and their life is tragic, and that you know they don't know how they're going to make it, and everything. Every time you meet them, like it's it's like they have to be like living a life worse than Job, and they got to tell you about it every time. They want you to sit there and feel sorry for them, and they whatever. I'm not saying be that person, but I'm saying the thing is that when somebody has going through something, you need to be bearing with that person's burdens. Why? Because you know what? When you're going through something, you want that person to also bear with you. Because you know what? Everybody wants somebody there around them when things aren't going right. But also somebody wants you to be there when things are going right and rejoice in those things that are going well. And we understand, obviously, in, in verse 3, it talks about the fact of, of the, ultimate, uh, the ultimate sacrifice for sin, which, uh, you know, which Jesus Christ is and was and ever will be. That he is the perfect, blameless, sinless uh, you know, uh, sacrifice for our sins. That he covered our sins, both past, present, and future of sins. 
Number two is this, that Jesus' appointment as high priest in verses 5 and 6. Melchizedek is a type of Christ or a foreshadowing. When it talks about Melchizedek, it's a type of Christ or a foreshadowing. Or a foreshadowing. But I believe that honestly that Melchizedek, in Gen- when he's brought up in Genesis chapter 14 and you, kinda, you, know, you, you see him talked about not a lot, but he's here and there, I believe that that's an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. Because, and we'll get into that a little bit more in Hebrews chapter 7. That's not something that's like, you better believe this or you're going, whatever. That's, I'll show you the reason why I believe that it is an Old Testament appearing of Jesus Christ. And if you say, you know what, it's more figurative and that's, you know, it's, it's not really him, that's, that's between you and the Lord. You know, it, it doesn't, it's, it's not something to sit there and, you know, and start a fight over, in other words. All right? But I, that's what I believe. I believe that, that it's an Old Testament, uh, you know, for, uh, it's an Old Testament uh, appearance of Jesus Christ. And you say, well, how is that possible? Well, you know what? He, uh, he appeared in the fiery furnace. He appears throughout the Old Testament at different times. And, uh, and, we, uh, and we see those different times. And, you know, I, I know I said this probably a few years ago, but there's going to be a time where I'll, you know, we'll go through those different times where he shows up in the Old Testament. And it's not just once or twice, it's quite a few times. But Jesus didn't glorify himself so that he would be made a high priest. He didn't say, hey, everybody, look at me, look at what I'm doing. I want to be a high priest. You know the reason why? is because he is the final, the only high priest that we ever need. Why? Because he's meek and lowly in heart. When we hear that word about meek, or, or, or somebody being meek or meekness, they automatically, you know, must must rhyme it and think that that's what it means. They go, meekness, weakness. They think weakness is meekness and meekness is weakness. It's, it's nothing, that's nothing further from the truth, but it's rather the willingness to depend on God and submit to his will. That's what meekness is. It's the willingness to depend on God and submit to his will. You know, and this attribute is uh, essential for those who seek to follow Christ. We need, I mean, if we're going to follow Christ and learn and grow and do all those things, what do we need? We need to be meek. Not weak, but we need to be meek. We need to be willing to depend on God and submit to his will. That when God asks us to do something, that we do it, we don't sit there and make excuses for it, right? Amen. What do I mean by, you know, uh, by lowly in heart? Well, lowly or lowliness, you know, Jesus, you know, uh, this is referring to his willingness, uh, to Jesus' willingness to identify with the weak, the poor, and the marginalized. He is, he is not concerned with uh, earthly uh, power or prestige, but rather with serving and loving others. That's what Jesus Christ came to do. What did he do? Come to seek to save that which was lost, right? Well, how do we identify with it? How do we do this? How do we, how do we come to these things? Well, for one thing, with meekness, we need to recognize our need for God's guidance and strength and to, and to submit to his will. And our, we, uh, that's what it means to be meek. It means that we are to recognize our need for God's guidance and strength and to submit to his will. What does it mean to be lowly in heart? It means that we are to identify with the weak and marginalize and to seek, and to, ser- uh, sorry, to, seek to serve and love them as Jesus does. We are no better than anybody else. Some people have been given, you know, have been given a bad hand, you know, a bad hand's been dealt to them, right? Other ones, you know, have been given, a, you know, a better one. But the thing is that no one is better than anybody else. I would actually say the one that's been given a bad hand, you know, uh, you know, that bad hand is easier to get saved than the one that you know uh, woke up with a silver spoon in their mouth. Because you know why the person with the silver spoon doesn't see their need for Jesus because they have money, and oftentimes money becomes their uh, becomes their God. But the person, you know, that has had that bad head, uh, hand dealt to them, they realize, they know, like, you know what, I need Jesus. And it, it's not 100% true, but I found that nine times out of ten, the one over here gets saved, you know, a lot quicker than the one over here, you know, that, you know, says that they don't need Jesus. Number three, Christ's obedience and faith. Christ's obedience and faith. We, we see in verses seven through ten, you say, well, Pastor, you're flying through this. I told you the first part of this, I said, I'm going to go pretty quick. Then I'll slow down, and we'll be here for another you know, couple hours. <laughs> Some are like, huh, huh, what? is he kidding? 
But we see in, in verses 7 through 10, you know, it begins to talk about, obviously, you know, his prayers and his submission. During Jesus' earthly life, especially during his ministry, we know what the Bible talks about, the fact of him offering up uh, prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him. So for those that say that you know, men don't cry, then they need to talk to Jesus because Jesus he was a man, is a man, and yet you know, for somebody to say that, you know, uh, that, you know, that if you're a guy and you cry that you're not a man, well, you don't need to talk to him because he cried more than you know, anybody else that you see in the Bible oftentimes. I mean, he wasn't like some sort of pansy that, you know, that he like, you know, somebody flicked him and he was like, ah, you know, like that. But he was crying because of over, over the affliction of the people, over their sins, over all those things. He said, you know what, he, he's a merciful God. And like I said, we know that he offered those things up. And the reason why is he's also able, because he's able to save us from death. And the thing is, is that because he was perfect, because he is perfect, because he will always be perfect, his prayers are always heard. So when we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, we are clothed in his righteousness, meaning that when we got saved in Christ, when they, we became, uh, were saved, what ends up happening is, is that our prayers are heard because of that. Well, people say, well, all prayers are heard. Nope, not all prayers are heard. And I'm referring to the unbeliever. You say, well, every, all prayer, no, they're not. You say, well, how do you know that? The only prayer that is heard by the unbeliever is the, is the prayer to receive Christ as their Savior. That is the only one. And then after that, obviously, they're believers, but they say, well, he hears every single, no, he does not. Why? Because they're at enmity with God. They're enemies of God. But the thing is that we also see, you know, through the fact that it's, you know, it talks about that Jesus showed us that through his sufferings, perfection. And you say, well, how is that possible? Well, the thing is, is that you ever notice that, that the times that you suffer for the cause of Christ, that all of a sudden you, you, you begin, to, you, 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 it's like you become more humble, if that's possible. You become meeker as you go. You rely upon God more. Why? Because you're being perfected by him. You'll never be perfect, but you're being perfected. The only time, uh, I should you know, switch that, you will be perfect at one time, but you've got to get a glorified body first. And that means you've got to die first. But while we're here on earth, we will never be, uh, you know, we'll never be perfect, but we're always seeking that perfection because we want to be as close to Christ. Not that we could do everything perfect. And I need to you know, preface that. Perfect means like you're complete, it doesn't mean that you do everything right. It means that you're complete. And the thing is that when you got saved, you are complete in Christ. Everything that Christ has for you, he gave to you at salvation. Amen. Now, it's a matter of if you want to give that back. You say, well, what are you talking about giving it back? I'm talking about the fact of you, you know what, like, like the Lord you know, has saved you from, I don't know, smoking or a bad mouth. And you're like, oh, I know the Lord you know, saved me, but I'm going to just say whatever I want, you know, comes out of my mouth because I'm saved and nothing's ever going to change that. There's a, there's a truth in that, but there's also an attitude that you need to change in that. Yes, you're saved and that's, you know, nothing can change that, but you know what? We are to be like Christ, not to sit there and see what we can get away with. It's like the child that knows that your parents love you no matter what, they're going to do anything for you, so they go around and they just do everything to, like, irritate them. And get them angry or, or everything that they possibly can to show that, that they are independent of their parents. I don't know, I'm 46 and I'm still dependent upon my parents. No, I depend upon their prayers. I depend upon their love. I depend you know, on the fact of calling them up and just talking to them. When we, like I said, when we suffer for the sake of Christ, we are learning what it means to be like Christ. We are being perfected. We see this Second Timothy chapter three verse twelve that says this: "It says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution." Second Corinthians chapter twelve verse nine says this. And this is Paul speaking. He says, "And he said unto me, because Paul prayed three separate times that his affliction will leave him." Played three separate times. And, he's, uh, and this is the response that the Lord gave to him. It says, and, and he said to me, 
This is Jesus you know, speaking and saying, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So when you are weak, he is strong. When you feel like you can't go on, he is strong. When you feel like you can't do anything, you can't do anything, you're like, I, I, don't, I come and stand in my rope, he's right there. He'll never leave you nor forsake you, but he, and he will also be your strength. Paul goes on to say, most gladly, therefore, will I, rather, uh, will I rather glory in my infirmities than uh, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He says, you know what? I know what my weaknesses are, and I'm going to glory in those. Why? Because you know what? Christ is strong in my weakness. Oftentimes, you know, especially guys, I mean, I mean, think about it. In anything, you know, they always want to be looked at as being the stronger, the, be- the bigger, the better, no matter what. I mean, and there's a, whole, there's a whole section probably on YouTube for stupid things that guys do to prove their, ma- uh, their manliness. I mean, think about it. I mean, I've seen guys, you know, sit there and go, well, uh, I know I can beat you. I can spin my head around this, you know, like I can put the bat right here, spin around, and I can still beat you. And there are people that will do that, and I sit there going, wow, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. You're trying to prove how manly you are by how dizzy you can get and still try and win a race. Nobody in here would do that, right, though? Nobody. I have to watch what I say because I used to be a youth pastor, and so some of this might apply to me. But because he suffered for us as our perfect sacrifice, we as believers have eternal life. Number four is this, and this is where I'm going to rest a lot of my sermon on the rest of the time, is this. The Hebrews' lack of spiritual maturity. The Hebrews' lack of spiritual maturity. The Hebrews were, uh, were dull of hearing and needed to be taught again the first principles of the oracles of God. As, as That's what the Bible says. So in other words, they needed to be taught the things that they should have been taught when they were new believers. But you know what? They've been sitting there you know, so long, so dull of hearing, not wanting to listen, you know, doing their own thing, that they actually forgot those things and they needed to be retaught again. They refused to move beyond those first principles of God's word. In other words, the, like I said, the basic principles of God's word, the elementary teachings, the ABCs of God's word. Like the fact that there are believers out there that would go up to like some of our kids in children's church and the kids in children's church would know more about the Bible than they would if we're going to put it on a physical level. Because of the fact that they just sat there and said, you know what? I mean, there's people that sit in church every Sunday and basically they sit there and that's what they do. They don't ever apply anything. They don't, whatever they get from, you know, uh, from here, they'll listen to it. They may listen to a couple things that they like, throw out some things that they don't like, usually something that usually messes with what they're doing. And then they go on, how come I cannot be like so-and-so? Or how come I can, just can't seem to grow? Every time I try to read, you know, to read God's word, I can't understand it. Or why can't I do this? And why can't I? What? It's because you have dulled your ears. The very basic teachings of salvation and spiritual growth, such, as, uh, such teachings as a, per, a person should be saved. A saved person you know, uh, should know that other people need to be saved. And they should know how a person saved by grace through faith right they should also a saved person should grow spiritually these are things that, that a saved person should know a saved person should live righteously they should li- uh, they should live a life that is pleasing to the lord we said well i'm never going to be perfect yes but you strive to do those things you strive you know what with what God's word says. If the Bible says, you found, you know, say you just found out, hey, the Bible says thou should not commit adultery. Hey, I should do that. I shouldn't commit adultery because it told me not to do that. You know, when you read something in God's word, do you apply it or you say, well, did he really mean I shouldn't commit adultery or I should narrow it down to only a few that I have adultery with? 
And you ask that question, but the thing is, is that oftentimes that's how Christians are being taught today, is that you just need to, quote unquote, look between the lines. There is nothing between the lines. It's black and white on, on those issues. A saved person should worship. A saved person should go to church. Thank you for being here. All these things, you know, talk, you know, talks about this in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. It says, iron sharpeneth iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. In other words, when you're around like-minded people, you sharpen one another, you get better, you understand God's word, you, you know the things of God's word. When you're going through things, they're able to be there with you. They're able to bear your burdens. And when they're going through something, they can count on you. It's the fact that we go through life together and we sharpen one another as we go through life. Amen. That's what we're supposed to do. Such basic truths as these are the milk of God's word. A young believer is a babe in Christ or a babe because, you know what, they just learned about it. But a person that has been saved for 40 years should not be at this level. A person stays immature because they refuse to grow up spiritually. Some people say, well, I just want to be saved and that's it. I don't want to do anything else. I just want to be saved. Saved is good enough. And they just want to stay there. They don't want to move on. They don't want to grow. They don't want to get any better. They don't want to do these things. They just say, I just want to stay there. And they refuse to grow up. It's like a kid that says, you know what? Now I need to switch to, uh, to fruits and vegetables and meat. But you know what? No, I'm going to st stay, keep on eating candy all the time. You're not going to grow in good ways if you keep on staying on candy, right? Let me put it another way. Sugar is not good for you. All the kids are appalled. They're sitting there like, oh, that's what I live off of. Sugar is not going to help you. The, you know, actually, what sugar does is just speed up your brain and every process of things is so much quicker. And then you know what? As soon as that you know, sugar high ends in about 15 minutes, then you're like, uh. And then you're like, I need another buzz. And so then you go get a Coke. And then after that, then you go get a Dr. Pepper. And then you're after that, you go get a baby bottle pop. And then after this, you go get this. And you keep going through all the entire day. And so then finally, at the end of the day, after all that sugar's worn off, you just like crash because, and then you know what? Nothing good has happened the entire day. You just have been hyper all day. <laughs> you say, well, pastor, right now you're talking so fast, it's like you're hyper. I did have caffeine. But they are, here's the thing is that they're still using milk, whereas strong meat belongs uh, belong to those who were of full age and have exercised their senses to discern both good and evil. We see this in verses 13 and 14. To grow until that person is... Uh, to grow until uh, that person is feeding upon the meat of God's word, what does that mean? That means studying and growing into uh, having an understanding life in Jesus Christ. But the Hebrew believers and a lot of believers uh, in the church today are spiritual babies still. What they need to do you know, is to share that glorious message of Jesus Christ with their friends, but they are unable to. Why? Why are people unable to share the gospel of Christ with other people? It's because they are immature, so immature that they, they themselves needed, to, needed someone to reteach them the principles, the first principles of God's word. Some, oftentimes I hear a person that says that they are not able to share Christ because I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't know, you know, I, I don't think I can, you know, go in that area. Well, you know what? For the past, you know, several years, we've been going out. And before we go out, I, you know, we always put, you put it out there saying, you know what? If you would like to go share the gospel, if you would like to learn how to do that, if you want to do that, come at 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoons. Some have taken us up on that. Other ones have not. But you say, well, I don't know how to do it. The thing is, 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 are you making excuses for why you don't know how to do it? Because you don't want to show up? And I understand, hear me on this. I understand Sundays and stuff like that, a lot of times, if you, a lot of times are busy. You may have family in town, you may be, all, all those things, that might be the day where you see everybody, I understand that. 
but I've never met somebody say, hey, pastor, I'm not able to make it on Sunday at 3 o'clock. Could you meet me on uh, Tuesday at 3 o'clock? Or whatever. Not one person. I am not that rigid in my schedule that I will not make time for a person that says, hey, you know what, I want to learn how to, you know, I want to learn how to share Christ so people are saved. I am not that mean of a person where I'm going to say, you know what, it's my way or the highway. I will do it. All right? I'll do it. I love, uh, I love it when people come up to me and say, hey, I want to learn how to share the gospel with people. Or I want to, you know, I love it when people come and say, hey, pastor, guess what? Guess who got saved? Because that's contagious right there. That's more contagious, you know, than COVID. Because the thing is that when people start getting saved, then it passes on to the other ones and the other ones and the other ones. And then you always have that, you know, bitter, grumpy, you know, person that's always like, mm, their excitement's a little bit too much for me. I don't like it. I don't know why they're say, I don't know why they're so happy about Jesus. I was like, you know what? As they used to say, you know, all back in the day, you know what? If you're saved, let your face know it. So, like I mentioned this earlier, but there are how many people have professed Christ, have gotten saved, and have never grown? Like I said, they've they've professed them years ago, but remained those spiritual babies for years. A person stays immature because of being unskilled in the Word of God. They are unskilled in the Word of God. The Hebrew believers remained unskilled in the, word of, uh, you know, in the Word of God. God himself is obviously the standard. We know that God is the standard for all believers. But that's who we're supposed to be like. When you call yourself a Christian, literally, Christian means Christ-like. You are saying that you are going to be Christ-like. And the thing is, is that when we say that we're unskilled in those things, obviously, obviously, like I said, God is the example. God is the standard. That's who we're supposed to be striving to be like. We're not going to get there, but you know what? That should never stop, for a per- that should never stop anyone who is competitive. My wife and I are competitive. There are certain things my wife's more competitive at than I am, and there are certain things that I'm more competitive than she is. All I'll say as far as my wife, do not play her in spoons. She is way more competitive than a lot of people in spoons, I'll tell you that. Anytime anybody walks away and there's injuries, no. Um, They're like, how do you get injured in spoons? Play my wife. She is not that bad, but she is competitive. I remember when we first got, and we still have this, by the way, we got a Nintendo Wii. We, you know, I, I got, you know, and we're first, you know, first married, and we're sitting there, and we're doing bowling. I never saw, like, and I say this, you know, like, almost like, I, I, you know, you have, like, a supernatural experience where you're out of body, but it's like, it's like two people, like, trying to mess up the person on a video game, where if you wanted to, I'm left-handed, by the way, you know, when I show you this demonstration here, where, if, by the way, if you wanted to mess somebody up, the only thing you have to do on a Wii is go. If you're doing Wii bowling, that's all you got to do, just a little. But we can sit there and we're all like, I mean, just like all in the form and everything else, making sure that strap is on our wrist so that way, you know, the remote doesn't fly through the TV. Oh, you laugh, but there's a reason why they gave you those straps. It's because people had done it. Sorry, wife, I'm outing you on all of your competitiveness this morning. I'm competitive in, in a lot of other things, but nothing's coming to mind right now. I just It's amazing how that works. But in other words, when I said, you know, the, the word of righteousness, that they're unskilled in the word of righteousness, in other words, the word of righteousness, righteousness means is that you're, that you're right with God and that you're doing what's right. You're right with God and you're doing what's right. That we are, I talked about this a little earlier. I said that we are clothed in his righteousness, right? When we are clothed in his righteousness is the fact that just because, you know, you know, just because I made the statement of that our sins are forgiven for past, present, and future does not mean that we don't ask God for forgiveness. We are still supposed to ask God for forgiveness when we sin. Why? Because it keeps our heart pliable towards him. That we recognize and say, you know what, what I did was wrong. It's like the fact of like, well, you know what, I'm not going to apologize to my mom because she knows. 
She just knows. Yes, you're probably already forgiven. Your mom's always going to love you. Your dad's always going to love you. They're always going to be there for you. But you know what? The fact of like going, oh, they just know that I love them. Or they just know that I you know, already forgave them. They already forgave me. I already know. I don't have to ask for forgiveness. That's a bad place to be. When you're, you know, especially in your relationships, you know, with other people, but also with the Lord, is that when you do wrong, when you go against God's word, you should go to God and say, you know what, God, please forgive me. You should feel some sort of sorrow for it. And the reason why we do that is because if we don't do it, we allow our hearts to get, you know, uh, to be hardened towards the Lord, and then we we slip back or we backslide. And a lot of times we start doing, maybe we start doing those things that we used to do that we, uh, that we didn't do anymore, but now we do them. Make sense? So how do we grow and mature in Christ? Well, the Bible teaches us all about God, Jesus, human beings, life, the world, and how to live uh, righteous and godly lives, right? But think for a moment. Think about this. Think about God. Just one of, one of these subjects, one of the subjects that I just brought up, Jesus, God, love, whatever you want, as far as what the Bible talks about. Now think about the fact of how vast and glorious God is. How big, how, ma- how amazing, how awesome, how powerful God is. And here's the thing, that when you start thinking that way, when you start saying, you know, how big and everything else, that all that God reveals in his word towards you, all those things, that you have studied God's word, you know God's word, and this happens the more you are mature in Christ, the more you understand about Christ, is the fact that when you get to that point, you said, you know, that, you know, that you're studying so much, that, that no matter how much you study or how long that it takes you to study, you're never going to f- understand the fullness of his truth. Has anybody ever, you know, uh, come to that point? I remember uh, uh, when I uh, was graduating, getting, uh, graduated Bible college, I was getting ready to walk the line, and I go like this, and I, I sat there and just began to, you know, sit there and just had a moment. Some of us have, always have moments. We just have those moments. And I sat there and I go, I'm supposed to be, I'm going to be getting married here, you know, in a couple months. I'm supposed to go be a youth pastor after that. I graduated college. I know nothing. And you go, well, why'd you go to college for? You didn't learn anything. No, I learned the fact that I, the more I learn about them, the, the less I know. Because there's always, God is infinite. God you know, is powerful. He's amazing. That no matter how much we study, we just come to that, uh, that conclusion that we go, I have no idea. I don't know. I, I know nothing. That's why when you go to read God's word, and all of a sudden you're going, has that verse always been in there? It's always been in there, but God you know, uh, didn't reveal it to you until you needed it. Until you needed to understand what that is. Because there's times where I've sat there and somebody says, hey, have you seen this verse? And I look in there and go, no, the ink's dry, so nobody just, just put it in there. It's always been in there, right? But it's amazing how many times people have this, you know, the thing that when they go to God's word, they're like, well, somebody must have put it in there. It has to be something new. No, because as you're growing, God begins to show you more and show you more and show you more and show you more. But there's a reasons why, like, uh, when, when I uh, preach certain things that I don't go as in-depth as I possibly could. Because as a pastor, I have to sit there and say, is my congregation able to handle this? I have to ask those questions when I teach certain things. I'm not saying you're stupid. Don't say, Pastor, stupid. He's saying we're stupid because we don't understand everything. No, because if I get up there and go, I don't know, I understand what, anything that he just said or anything. I'm not talking about, you know, any times where my voice, you know, may mess up or anything else. I'm talking about when you get into the meat of God's word, would you be able to understand it? Because there's nothing worse to be able to teach something like the meat of God's word and then to go over everybody's head because then what use did it do? But there's times where you sit there and say, okay, what level do I have to be at or what level do I have to, have to go in order for them to understand this? Make sense? It's like my wife went to college to be a teacher. She is a teacher. She was a teacher. She's always you know, done those things. But she teaches like... Kindergarten, first grade, she got up to, she only got up to second grade, right? She only went up to second grade. She didn't go any further. She didn't graduate onto all those things. She didn't go to Miss Rose's math class, you know, in high school. 
But my wife would not get up there teaching a, say, a second grader high school things. Why would she do that? They were like, they would check out immediately. Because they're like, I have no idea what you're saying. But say like Miss Rose gets in there, she starts to, you know, saying, all right, kids, let's learn your ABCs. The kids are going to be like, what are you talking about? I don't, I, I, I learned it like, you know, like 10 years ago. You have to know, you know, who you're talking to. You have to know, the, you know, the level of the people you're talking to. You can't sit there and just talk over people's heads. It's the reason why I don't talk to rocket scientists. My brain can't go to that level, I don't think. At least not at this time. But note, note these things, that it is possible to reach maturity in Christ. A person can grow spiritually until they are fully grown and mature in Christ. And this is what God actually expects of all believers. God expects all believers to be fully mature in Christ. So what is a mature person? A mature and fully grown person is a person who discerns between good and evil. He is a person, or they are a person who lives a righteous and godly life. They go beyond. They go beyond just attending worship and Bible studies. They go beyond just going to church every once in a while. They go beyond just giving money. They go beyond just reading the Bible. They go beyond just praying. You say, well, how can you go beyond those things? Well, the mature believer does all these things, yes, but they do them more, much more. Why? Because they love God and they want to, you know, they want to learn more. So the thing is, is that they not only that they not only do those things, they go beyond those things. They not only just uh, just read the Bible, they study God's uh, God's word. They go in depth in it. They actually block off times during the day where they can pray and worship. Some of us need to understand this: that the reason why you don't uh, have a good like devotion time is because you try to fit it in when other things are already scheduled. So what you need to do is schedule in your devotion time so you say, you know what, I'm not going to miss that. Amen. Some of us you know, also need to realize that if our day, like, you know, say all the kids wake up at, you know, at like 7, 8 o'clock, if we want to have a good devotion time where it's by ourselves, and you're going, don't you say it. If you want to have a good devotion time where there's no distractions, nothing's going on, the house is quiet, everything's quiet, wake up earlier. Pastor, you said it. Why did you say it? I don't know why you said that. Because I don't know about you, but I get distracted by the littlest things when I'm reading. It's like, you know, I don't, I can't remember, you know, what, what movie it was or whatever, but it's like I'm sitting there reading and all of a sudden I hear something and I'm like, squirrel. And there's like that squirrel moment that you have and just, whatever, I need that quiet in order to, in order to comprehend. Now, there are some of you that, I, I don't know how you do it. I can never comprehend this. I've, I've had students tell me this, that they, this is how they study. They have music in the background. They got TV going. They got something else going over here and then they're going, Yep, got it all. As they're studying for a test. I tried that. And so, it's, you know, a, a friend of mine, this is at school, actually it was a friend of ours that we just saw. He came in and he goes, so did you understand anything? I said, I have nothing, but I, you know, I, I, was, I was rocking out to some good music. That's all I know. I don't have, I don't have that capacity to, to focus with all that stuff going on. So if you're one of those people, I don't like you. But set aside that time. Set aside that block of time to, to pray, to worship, to read God's word, to study God's word. Number three is this, is that this person lives and moves and has their being in prayer. That is, that they are continually praying. You say, how can you continually pray? I've met people that as they're going, they're just praying. They may not be praying out loud, but in their mind they're going. You know, they're praying about for so-and-so. Or somebody came across that, hey, could you pray for this person? And, they're, uh, and, and as they're going, they're, they're praying, and they're continually praying. This person, you know, keeps their mind and their thoughts on Je- upon Jesus and obedience towards him. 
that when they see something happening, you know, that they know is against God's word, they're like, you know what, I'm going to be obedient to what God's word is, even if this hurts. They also, they also are witnesses for Christ. They share that glorious salvation from uh, evil and death uh, of this world, that they go out and they tell people about Jesus Christ. Why? Because what they have, they want to give. That they have Jesus and they say, you need Jesus too. It shouldn't just be a nice little uh, you know, slow, uh, slogan on a shirt saying, y'all need Jesus. No, they do need Jesus. Don't just have it on your shirt saying, okay, I did my witnessing. I told them they needed Jesus. Jesus right now is more, you know, more of a byword than he's actually something that people actually care about. He's actually more of just an afterthought to most people. They'll see it on there and they're like, oh, ha, 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 that's a funny shirt, and they'll keep on walking. They don't care. Tell them about Jesus and why they should care. And this person, this mature believer, they're able to discern both good and evil and does the good. There are people that can understand. Kids understand it to a certain point. There are certain things I'm supposed to do and certain things that I don't do. All right? But oftentimes, kids, babies, immature believers will say, I know the good, I know the evil, but I'm still going to do the evil because that's what I want to do. Or they'll still say, I know the good and the evil, and I'm going to do good this time. And they flip-flop back and forth between the two. But the mature believer says, I know that, you know, that this is bad, but I'm going to do good no matter what. Or I know this is good, and I'm going to do it. There's, no matter what, they're always continually looking towards that good and evil. And they know which one, is, you know, which one it is, and they know that, you know, and they, are, they have decided that that's what they're going to do, that they are going to do it. A mature believer lives for, uh, for Jesus. And some of you are listening to this morning saying, Pastor, I understand this. I know this. Uh, this has been preached to me forever. But the thing is, is that maybe it's for somebody else, or maybe it's for, for you in particular because you haven't learned it yet. My wife taught me this. Repetition does good. She didn't say it that way. She speaks better than I do. But repetition does good. Why? Because when you repeat stuff over and over, you remember it. Because right now, if I were to you know, say something to my daughter of um, listen and obey what? Listen and obey what? She knows exactly what it is the first time. Why? Because we repeated that. She knows it. Because repetition is good. That's why some of you go, two plus two, and you're like, four. Hopefully you answered four on that one. Because you repeat them over and over again. You know these things. So the believer, obviously the believer is, a, a, a mature believer is someone who is grow, uh, growing in the Lord and doesn't do it out of obligation. They don't do it out of obligation, but they do it out of love for Jesus and what he has done. So I want to end with this. Number one is this. You've heard this entire thing. You, went, you, know, uh, you say, well, pastor, I'm not saved in the first place. I, you know, I want to be saved, but I'm not saved, so I don't know what this has to do with me. Well, you know what? Change that this morning. Come forward. We'll pray for you. You know, we'll lead you, you, know, uh, we'll lead you to, uh, to the Lord. We'll, uh, you know, you'll be saved before you leave. If that's you, please don't you know, uh, take that you know, lightly and say, well, I can do that later. You don't know how much time you have, and that's not a, like, a, like a scare tactic. That's the fact is that nobody in this room knows how much longer they have to live. Nobody. I'm here right now, but tonight maybe the Lord takes me. I don't know. I don't think he's going to, but I don't know. And secondly is this, is that you say, you know what, Pastor? I was growing. I was learning. But something got in the way. Something distracted me. Something got in the way, you know, to where I said, you know what, that I, I'm, not, I'm not studying, I'm not, you know, praying, I'm not, you know, my focus and everything is not upon Jesus. I'm not witnessing, I'm not doing these things. I need to reprioritize my time. I need to, you know, I need to refocus my priorities and say, Jesus, you're important. I need to set that block of time, put that on my, you know, on my list, because you know what, everybody has a calendar. Everybody says, you know what, I'm going to put this in there for this block of time and say, yeah, I'm going to do this, 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 and this, but oftentimes people don't have a time where they say, you know what, this is when devotions are going to happen. Or this is a time where I'm just going to be studying God's word for a couple hours. 
And don't be shocked by the fact that I, that I said a couple of hours because the thing is, is that there might be people in here that said, you know what, I can't do that. But you could study the Olympics for like five, six hours a day. You say, you know what, Pastor, I don't know necessarily how to study God's Word. I don't know how to do some of these things. Well, for one thing, I'm going to tell you this, give you a preview for Wednesday. I'm going to teach you some ways of doing that this Wednesday. So if you have that desire, you want to know how to, how to do these things. You say, well, Pastor, I can't be here on a Wednesday night. We record it. Watch it online. But be here Wednesday night. So if you have questions on what to do, you can ask questions. We have Bible study on Wednesdays specifically for that reason, so you can ask questions. I mean, you can ask questions to me afterwards if you want to. That's fine. But on Wednesday night specifically, we take questions. We say, what do you want to know? But let me get back to what I was talking about is, is, is the fact that you either want to get saved or you say, Pastor, something got in the way. Something was a distraction. Something caused me to lose my focus. I need to refocus my priorities. And I want to make that declaration to the Lord saying, Lord, I, you know, help me to remember to block that time off on my, on my calendar. Help me, help me to block that time and say, and nothing is going to come in between that. Don't sit there and say, well, you know what? It's okay. I'll hit the snooze button again. It's fine. I'll only read God's word for 20 minutes as opposed to 30 minutes. No, get up. Get up. Because there's no easy way of waking up out of bed other than getting up. You can hit the snooze as long as you want. You can hit uh, that as much as you want. And you know what? You're more tired. Why? Because you keep falling back asleep. And then all of a sudden you're going to be like, oh, wait, I got to go to work. I can't do that right now. And then you've missed out on another time. And then you're going to try and do it at night. And you're going to be falling asleep as you're reading it or praying or worshiping. I always say it's best to do it in the morning. Whatever your morning is, if you work at night, you know your morning is probably in the afternoon. If you work during the day, obviously it could be in the morning. I don't know what time you got to get up. But for the next few moments, if that's your desire, you want to come forward, you say, Lord, I come to this altar and I just want to make that declaration of, Lord, help me to, to pick out a time, to stick to it, to remain to it, and to just get, my, uh, get myself out of bed instead of hitting the snooze. If that's 